Thank you. Well, welcome everyone and thank you for um, joining us at such short notice. Uh, the Championship and League One Advisory Group wish to make the following statement. After discussions with our members, the Championship and League One clubs overwhelmingly intend to vote no to the RFL's resolution at the EGM to be held on Friday the 14th of September. We are, however, not against change. We are very prepared to work with all stakeholders to deliver a progressive vision for the future in time for any broadcast renegotiation due in 2020. The Super League proposal represents an irrevocable and irreversible transfer of authority to a group of individuals and an abandonment of the wider game. This dispute, which is not of our making, is not at the right time, midway through a broadcast cycle, <coughs> is not discussing the right issues and is publicly demonstrating a lack of confidence in the sport. Despite assurances, we have been excluded from direct discussions and now a campaign has emerged with attempts to pressure vulnerable clubs into capitulating. As a result, a handful of clubs are undecided on how to vote. Like any competition structure, the current format is not perfect, but could have been modified to improve it. We believe a restoration to a 14-team Super League with an automatic one-up, one-down and a second-place playoff, including the 13th-placed Super League clubs via a million pound game is the correct position. Further, the Championship and League One clubs are happy to peg the revenue share and percentage of the broadcast revenue so the whole game goes up or down together. The financial proposal put forward thus far for consideration is unviable. There is a clear shift in resources both human and financial from the RFL to a privately owned company at the expense of the wider sport. All funding reductions would fall squarely on the RFL Championship and League One and community game to the point of rendering an increasing number of clubs unviable and placing the Championship and League One competition formats at risk of failure in the future. The RFL Super League proposal doesn't offer any positive vision for the future of the whole of the game. No unbiased analysis, evidence or rationale for change. It is driven by protectionism and vested self-interest and it would reintroduce failed concepts, loop fixtures and a one-up, one-down format with huge parachute payments distorting the championship division. It doesn't make any sense for the overseas inclusion in the sport of Catalan, Toulouse and Toronto to be on different terms. It's a rotten solution, negative and defensive, lacking vision and independence. Thank you. What we've also got to assist you to understand the financial element is an additional slide, which is pretty self-explanatory, which you can read forward. Any questions? <coughs> Under as I understand it, if they're going to get this passed tomorrow, they'll need votes from four non-Super League clubs. Because I, that's what I understand the position to be. You, you've mentioned, obviously, pressure being put on uh, non-Super League clubs to turn the line, basically. Um, do you, I mean, are, are you confident that you can stop four of those clubs, you know, from joining, you know, for, from voting in favour of this proposal? So at least it's going to be a tight, tight vote, isn't it? Let's face it. We've tried to keep our members fully informed all the way. The formation of this advisory group was to demystify the um, emails and ideas and presentations that have been coming forward so that they could be as informed as possible so that they might make a decision with that clarity. At the end of the day, we're not telling anyone how they should vote, making their own minds up. <clears throat> Do you think, I mean obviously the Super League clubs are not united, uh, there's at least one obviously that will vote against this proposal, uh, and there might be more, but I mean that we, we understand there is pressure being brought to bear on some of, you know, any other club that might be prepared to break that, um, you know, to break with the majority. 
have you spoken to any super Look, I've, it's, there, there is a, there's a lot of, at stake from the financial side of what's being proposed up. There's significant gain and upside to Super League clubs through the SLE. So there's a significant transfer of, of um, um, financial <coughs> um, gain for this to go forward. So none of this is surprising that um, um, clubs would be being put under pressure to vote um, one way or the other. It's no surprise. Do you believe there are clubs in Super League being put in under pressure to vote a certain way? Oh, I, I, I don't doubt that, that, that that isn't the case. I don't doubt it at all. To, to the board as, as a whole, do you expect by the end of play tomorrow that this will have been passed through or do you fully expect this to be rejected by the end of tomorrow? Look, um, the discussions that we've had, and I can just repeat, and we've had you know, numerous face-to-face -face communications with League One and Championship clubs, there's an overwhelming position that is to reject the proposal. But I think the sort of view we take is, you know, people will step up to the ballot box and they'll, they'll cast their vote and sometime around midday tomorrow we'll know with clarity. If the vote goes against, um, you know, what, what you've set out here, um, what, what will you do then? Um, oh, it's, a, it's a fair question. I and mean, we're still considering, we're con still considering our position in that regard, but I, I think the right forum for members to contemplate such um, important decisions is the RFL Council, that's the Supreme Chamber, that's the place for members to debate and discuss out why they think um, it is what it is. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. You made it clear that you would prefer an alternative of 14 teams in Super League, in four, presumably 14 teams in the Championship. Interestingly enough, we've had a, on our website, we've had a vote this week, and that, that proposal has swept the board. That's what all our readers want as well, actually. Which we may, may or may not want to call in as evidence for that proposal. But I just wonder whether you're going to put a counter proposal tomorrow for that. Because, you know, I think a, an awful lot of people don't want to see, you know, even if, e even fans who are purely Super League fans who have got no interest in the Championship don't want to see loop fixes. You know, they, they just bore the pants off everybody, really, to be honest. It's just ridiculous, in my, in my view. And I'm sure a lot of Super League fans feel the same way. So, I mean, I just wonder whether you're going to put forward this, uh, this is a counter-proposal tomorrow, as an, as an amendment, to, so to speak, to the the main proposal to, 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 to yeah. get a vote on that. Martin, could I just come in there really on a couple of points that, that's on the questions that's been raised. First of all, that point you've just raised there. Ultimately, the number of teams in Super League is a matter for Super League. Uh, so in terms of us <coughs> suggesting that there should be 14 teams in Super League, that's really all it is. And I think that... Well, the problem, if you carried a vote on it, that would, you know, but, put a lot of pressure on them. But the, the, the proposal we've put forward purely relates to how our competition and the mechanism of getting into Super League uh, happens, which is basically that there would be one automatic relegation uh, and promotion spot and a second um, where the 11th team in Super League will play in a playoff with three teams in the Championship to create a potential second uh, promotion spot. Clearly that it, that's weighted heavily uh, in favour of the full-time 11th position Super League, uh, but that gives the million pound game and we believe creates uh, interest uh, in, in, in the, the whole concept of, 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 uh, of, of our position in the Championship. Ultimately, as Andrew says, that we believe the 14-team Super League is the answer, but that is really out of our our uh, ambit really. Can you shed more light on the um, pressures as you put it here and I think Andrew you referred to it as threats um, being put on the championship and league one clubs from Super League? I'd, I'd like to come in on that as well because I feel strongly about that, probably uh, more strongly than Andrew. 
Uh, I've been involved in the sport as chairman of Batley for 21 years and to me we, we, we've hit a low point here in the sport. Um, when we have a club, t to me the, the decision tomorrow should be based on, on everybody's views of what they think is best for the sport and I appreciate that there may be uh, differing views to the advisory group but you should vote and the club should vote as they think is right for the sport. What's happened is uh, certainly one thing that's come to our attention is a championship club being told that if they don't vote in favour of the proposal there will be no dual registration next year. There will be uh, n not able to use or share training facilities and there will be no uh, planned friendly. Now to me that, that is sinking pretty low. That's not asking someone to vote because one side is a better argument, that is bullying. And I find that for our sport that's always stuck together, always been uh, uh, united, the supporters of Super League, the supporters of Championship, the supporters of League One, the supporters of the community game, all want the whole sport to thrive. And to me, once we get to that, that bullying scenario, it's pretty low. And I find that disgusting. Can I ask two questions? The first would be, is it a secret ballot tomorrow? Has that been decided yet? And yes. And secondly, is getting to a UGM two weeks away from the end of the regular season an abstention of governance? Well, I'll, I'll let someone uh, ask, answer the second point, but on the issue of the secret ballot, I have been in email uh, contact with the <coughs> RFL about that because we don't believe a secret ballot is appropriate. This is a, a, a historic decision of, of tremendous uh, effect on, on the sport. <coughs> and to me, if, if you feel strongly uh, enough to vote either for or against the proposal, let's put, put it on the mast. Let's let everybody know who voted what way, who went in what camp, and how everybody stands in the league. And that's an open process. It, it avoids people hiding behind some kind of uh, secret ballot and uh, no doubt in five years time when things uh, don't go right nobody will have voted for it. Would it not benefit you if it was a secret ballot because clubs that were being bullied into vote a certain way could give the impression well, that they might have voted differently? If it does benefit us so be it. Uh, but I think the, 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 the correct, in my view, as that's a, only my personal view, the correct stance is an open ballot. And up, it should be a written, a written vote, but open. Do you get an answer on that? At and the moment, what was going to be? at the moment, unless matters are changed tomorrow at the meeting, the rugby league uh, believe it should be a secret ballot, and they've exercised their discretion. I've pointed out that the articles of the rugby league do not provide for that, and I've been told yeah, that I'm correct on that point, but that the chairman. Uh, as a discretion and they're exercising that discretion as we speak to, to put forward a secret ballot. Uh, we will be pressurising at the meeting to change that opinion and, and I don't know what the Super League uh, view will, would be on that aspect. Certainly as you just said, uh, if they've pressurised a club and bullied a club into voting a certain way, they may want to know how they did vote. Um, that's not the reason why I think it, it should be an open open vote. I simply think that everybody in the sport should know where everybody stands on this issue. This is a, a question for anyone who's, who's willing to answer it, but, but how on earth does the sport move on from Friday? Because whatever happens, there's going to be a dozen clubs unhappy with the result. I mean, this split that's been brewing for nearly a year now, it, it seems almost irretrievable in terms of getting everyone back together on the same page. Can the sport get on the same page again after Friday, no matter what happens? I think a lot rests on, on what the RFL do. They, they need to stand up and be, be the governing body, which they haven't done. They've, they've sat on the fence, they've, they've worked with Super League, in my opinion, un underhandedly, in cajoling clubs to vote one way or other, when, like, uh, Kevin just said that the vote should be on what you believe is right for your club and the whole game, irrespective of what other people try and 
manipulate you towards. You should vote what's right for you, your club, your fans, and what's good for the game. And uh, I don't think that's uh, it's absolutely despicable what's happening in uh, with, with, with other clubs and what they're trying to uh, bully 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 clubs into doing. I think and I think the rugby league had a part in that as well. Mike, right, I mean, do you think? I mean, this is an appalling mess. Isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's a shocking situation in my view, and, and, and as bad as I've known it for a long time, I've been involved in the game for more than, longer than most people here. But I mean, it, you've got to say that surely it, it's incompetence by the rugby football league and the leadership, as, you, as, you, as you've just said, to allow this situation to develop at all, to allow the Super League clubs to, you know, break free, or, or at least partially break free as they did do last year. You know, for, 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 for Nigel to not have been able to prevent that, I think shows a lamentable lack of, um, you know, competence and, and, and leadership. And, and not to be able to stand up to Lennigan, Ian Lennigan, quite frankly, because, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've got great sympathy with the idea that Super League is the, you know, the, the showpiece for the game. And I agree with Lennigan in so far as, you know, that, that, that it is. But you can't take Super League forward and leave the rest of the game behind because you just, you know, you, you, you're creating a, 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 an absolute whirlpool of, of, you know, that's going to drag everybody in if, uh, if, if, if it goes on. No, I'd agree. I, I haven't seen a lot of leadership from as chairman and I haven't seen a lot of leadership uh, from his executive board. Whenever I phone up Brian, he never wants to be quoted on anything. You know, he, he will only ever speak off the record. Well, that's not good enough, is it? Let's face it. It's not no, good. you need a chairman to lead. Yeah, yeah. It is, it, you need a chairman to lead. That's why he's in that position mm. to lead to lead the executive board. And I don't believe that's happened. Mm. Can you confirm which club, which championship club has had the threats made? I know, as an example, Rochdale train with Warrington at their facilities. Can you confirm which championship? I, I don't club? think it'd be appropriate for us to say that at the moment. <laughs> okay. If, miles away. if the if this doesn't take place, and you might be correct. Can I say you might be correct there? If the if by twenty twenty one, if if this doesn't get passed, how do you how do you see the championship of the one survive if Super League after that split take their own TV deal and leave you on your own? How how can championship of the one club survive without Super League? Well, we we've, we've got a great product. With three tiers of the professional game, and two of those tiers are thriving. Uh, I believe that League One and the Championship, is, the product is absolutely fantastic. It's growing every year. Uh, so, you know, we need to, we need to work ourselves and get our own TV deal. Uh, and that's something we've got three. We've, if we stick to what we've got and we grow this structure, and it need, it it can be tweaked and it can be improved. But we can grow this and we can get our own TV deal. Uh, there's lots of different the, the viewing the broadcasting market's changing changing all the time. I believe we've got a great product and I also believe that uh, we could do that ourselves. And are you confident that, obviously at the minute you get £10 million, pounds, so are you confident the TV deal you could get would be worth £10 million pounds per year? We're hopeful of getting a decent um, uh, uh, TV deal, but if you look at the actual <coughs> figures and what, what the room needs to understand is we've only had these figures for two days, people are saying drags on and on and on. You've got to remember that we haven't been involved um, uh, just on the outskirts of being involved in negotiations and these figures have just been dropped on us over the last couple of days but you talk about well if, uh, if there's nothing there at the end of the deal. We've nothing there at all. If you look at those figures that includes us and the RFL. Um, even with a tiny reduction you can see that the figure there is only just enough to keep the RFL going. What on earth are we going to get? So. It's a case of we'd have a big problem there and we'd battle to save our clubs but at the same time we're no worse off than what Super League have suggested to us. I know that Mr Lennigan um, fired his local newspaper said what more do they want, we've offered them the same money if the money stays the same. He's off the speed, they haven't offered us the same money he did. Um, and so, then, so these figures come from Super League? These, are, these figures are what Super League? <coughs> no, they come from the RFL because the RFL um, 
insist on saying it's their proposal in our view it's actually the Super League proposal which the RFL then proposed to us. So, so the RFL are proposing that Super League share of the 40 million, if it's 40 million, goes up to 32 points. Well it could at certain points, as you look yeah. down the list, it, they, could, they could be in a terrible situation where they're no worse off. Mm. Um, but as you can see that on the 40 million deal, we're not the same as we were before, it's 7.75. On Ian's suggestion at um, the first meeting we had for him to, to put across his view, we had, he suggested that if it remained at 40, our money would remain the same. But Robert Elston is, um, is doing a great job for Super League teams, let's not knock the fella. He's working for the Super League teams and he's uh, managed to negotiate it down to 7.75. But with a 7% reduction, and there's there's a lot of comment in the papers, it could easily drop 7%. I thought it was 9 million actually, but um, maybe, that's, maybe this is... It's 9.75 9 I think, mm -hmm. but it goes up by a slight amount, so that by the time you reach 22 it's at 10 million. Um, there's two million being shaved off for, uh, to start with, and then uh, we we'll then hit on the share share back. As you can see, if it gets down to 30, we get nothing. But as you can imagine, at say 33 million, for example, um, a drop of seven million, which I think is around eight percent off the top of my head, um, the Super League money retain remains the same, and us and the RFL are down to three. Well, the RFL can't run the game with all the officials and staff and things it needs to do on three million, never mind give the other clubs some money. So even as I say with the 7% deduction, you would imagine the RFL will need five million and leave us with nothing. So th there's no money there, you know. that I don't see how anybody can argue that that's a fair distribution of money like they're trying to argue in the papers. We've not been in a position to move this forward. It's been dragging on for months and months and months and we've been excluded from the majority of meetings. If I was now reading these figures, I'd be thrilled to bits. Because yes, that's a problem. A, you could offer 30 million a year. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the clubs, you think the clubs would accept it? And it's good night Vienna for everybody I mean, else. For the RFL to put this together is just madness. Like, yes. Um, it's a negotiating tactic. Yeah, I think the, the biggest issue we have is that the RFL have made this their own proposal. So the question we're asking is, and I'm somebody who's been running a club for 18 years, mm. um, a very mo modest club, one where there's certainly no ego trip on, one where I'm just a lover of the game. and. Uh, I've been in there for 18 years, similar to Kevin, just grafting away. And I can't believe that they can put a proposal to us and tell us how good it is. We're, we haven't fallen out of a tree, people who've managed to keep a, a club going for, for 15 to 20 years, and there's a number of us. This is a shocking deal, and it's the end of Championship and Championship 1. People might say, well, they deserve all the money to Super League and whatnot, but there's a lot of other people feel it should be trickled down, and there's a... With, do, do we want an NRL system? Maybe a lot of people do, where there's <coughs> just nothing below it. Is it safe to say that this isn't about structure? That um, you've already shown by way of compromise to what was originally proposed. It's about the future of the sport after 2021. This is about who's in charge and who's got hold of the steering wheel. And as we all know, if, if everybody's finances were squeezed, that, that in itself is power and control. And if you're left with, with just nothing, and they've got complete power and control over, over the clubs. We, we know that, that Super League's the main competition, and that's the thing where this, it can drive the sport and benefit all the other divisions. And there's many of us uh, who know that our club's incapable of being a Super League club because of our supporter base. But surely there's a place in the game for your Dewsbury's and Batley's and your Rochdale's and other teams, long established clubs, who've, who've, who've brought some great players through. And um, it would be absolutely impossible on those figures, I don't think anybody can deny. And the, the, the issue I have, it's been argued that this is a fair and equitable distribution of the money. And as we can see, if it's just a sneeze from, um, from, from Sky, the money drops to a situation where it's unviable for not just one or two clubs, everybody. What, what, what? What I find frustrating, I mean, you, you, you look at the, the, the way the RFL negotiated this current deal, and to sell the rights for your competitions to Sky with, with no requirement to broadcast the competition, that just what a bloody madness. Really. We, we have had some broadcasts, to be fair. I mean, the middle eights, our teams are involved, the yeah, Blackpool but Bash. Not, but not your competition during the year. No, you know, no. Um, apart from the Summer Bash. Which again is great television, in my view. I mean, well, like, absolutely. Know, the Summer Bash, I think, 
tremendous. Absolutely. <laughs> just a question. Just, just back to the, the pressuring of the books. Mark has suggested that the archives have a hand in that. And I think Andrew, you were clear in your column talking about conspiracy, that the archives are joining in a conspiracy. Is, is that the shared view of the group, that there is an archival involvement in, in these pressures? I think it's clear that RFL staff have made calls to clubs um, to discuss the matter, uh, and some of those calls have overstepped the mark. Particularly suggestions to remove big central events from one club, can you shed more light on that? I don't, I don't think we've heard that, but at the same time the RFL's argument is that they've made a proposal and they're wanting support for it, but what would normally happen is with an RFL's proposal, we'll make a proposal and then you maybe come back to the next meeting and, and have a vote on it. Um, they've, they've, they've taken a very strong steer on this, almost uh, a three-line whip um, to try and get everybody in line. And it, in the last 20 years, as uh, I've never known the RFL lose any vote, certainly at the Championship League One level. And uh, the only certainty is they will lose the vote in actual numbers. I can guarantee that the vast majority of clubs will be voting against this. The, the, we've, we've got the forms in from a number of them who've said, please just take it that I've already made my decision. Whether or not we can get 20 out of 24 is also going to be difficult. When you look, we've got from West Wales up to a team of the size of, of Bradford in there. And now with Stage United, I don't think there's any other sport where you can show such such unity over so many years. We've always given and taken, but we feel as if um, it's just totally unpalatable. Can you shed more light on that? Sorry, Andrew, just, I know you're saying you can't, there, there is a threat to remove big central events from one. I think it's, 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 we're being clear, there's pressure being born on every party to vote one way or other by all those interested stakeholders. That's the reality of it. And that's the sort of situation where, from an advisory group perspective, we're sort of, we're comfortable sort of making the running, trying to demystify it, trying to provide with much clarity so that clubs can be in the best position to, to um, place their vote with, with, with that clarity. That's, we're trying to do that, it's disturbing to hear the things that are happening. But whether that affects the way they vote, well, we'll find out tomorrow afternoon, won't we? You can't see what event that is. I can't say. Mark, you were saying that the Championship and League One clubs have been cut out of negotiations. Yes. I mean, how disappointing is that when you've got Super League, Chief Exec, Rugby League, Chief Exec, and then Chairman, and it's come to this? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we attended a meeting uh, at Salford. Um, uh, Robert was at the meeting together with uh, three Super League chairmen. Um, we had a fairly positive meeting, but if I'm totally honest, I think they couldn't see any headway for moving on a fair and equitable system uh, in having further meetings with us. And um, I, I myself phoned up on many occasions and meeting after meeting was cancelled. And uh, it was left with executives from the RFL to meet with Robert on most occasions. And uh, on occasions, Brian said that he's had, uh, the chair has said he's had literally dozens of hours of meetings. And as it was pointed out by one of, uh, one of our members, well, how many, how many meetings have you had with us? He hadn't had any meetings with us. So it's extremely disappointing because you want to have dialogue. We, we don't want a problem where the, 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 the game is literally brought, brought to a standstill. We're the people who clearly love the game, but at the same time we can't allow um, allow a situation where um, one by one we're just going to fall to the floor. Um, everybody knows that they've got to make the club more streamlined and what have you, and there's many examples I could show you where clubs have done a lot of good. But to be excluded and then said that we've been fully fully versed and fully informed and being involved in discussions before it's reached this point is, is, is annoying to be fair. But let's face it, the, this whole process sort of after the Lenigan letter of last year kicked off with a press conference where there was an announcement made, a new CEO unravelled for Super League and the eights were confirmed as abandoned. I mean, that was the that was the starting position without any consultation. I think the actual starting position was probably Ian's letter, Andrew, wasn't no, it? No, from the, absolutely. Yeah. This year. 
from that point. That, the, that's the environment you've been in. On the back of that, should you win the vote, would you expect to vote at no confidence in the RFL? Would you expect resignations from the governing body? We, we've got to consult as members. The, the, this panel doesn't decide everything. We, we, we're just constantly consulting on a day-to-day -day basis. As many questions coming back to us. We're a band of 20-some clubs. We're, we're, we're not a band of five who will say, we'll do this, we'll do that. We, 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 it's constant consultation with our members and then we've got a wide breadth of members and it, it's quite interesting talking to them and seeing what, what issues we've all got. We want to move together and uh, as a group we'll decide. But I think any time you have a board that's not in tune with its members, it does put the board in a difficult position. Sure, that's, that's the reality. Yeah. I know Andrew in your comment said that it was in whatever way the vote went, you, you said it was impossible to see the RFL restoring any kind of moral authority over the professional game. Is the RFL board's uh, position untenable? Well, I mean, that's a question for them to decide, but it really flows on from the previous discussion in the situation where you've got um, members clearly wanting to follow one path and one course of action and a board minded to go another. I mean, that, that sort of disconnect isn't, of course, helpful and it needs to be resolved one way or another. I, th I think the issue is, in, in my view, um, do the RFL tomorrow listen to what's happening and act on, on, on what the views of the whole sport are or are they pressurised in, into doing a, a certain way of action uh, of one section of the sport. <coughs> and there are a lot of pressures which we just aren't clear on. For example, you know, there's motor litigation between Super League and the RFL. Well, we don't know what the nature of that is. We don't know how much leverage that's being brought to bear and how that's affecting people's decision making. These are all problematic. There's not the clarity of disclosure that we would want to be able to tell our members about. So you're saying there is litigation between It's been motored absolutely in the briefing papers. Mm. Have you had any consultation with the, the seven aspects of the community again to get a vote? Because they're seen as pretty decisive in terms of getting any sort of majority. Have you got a steer on which way they'll go? I haven't personally had an opportunity, no. We've sort of, to be fair, had our hands full dealing with the, the Championship and League One members. But I mean, likewise, they've got a vote, they've got a position, and we respect that. Jeremy Leatherington's been pretty vocal from the start and supported. The championship and league one. What can you chap say about what Heather Hinton said right from I think he right after Elston was appointed he came out with that statement basically supporting championship and league one? I think he's he's been pretty clear. He said that the you know the game needs vision, direction and strategy and before deciding, you know, what you're gonna have for for tomorrow, he's saying let's think about where we wanna be in ten years time or fifteen years time and lay out a direction and a vision and a strategy to go with it. And it's the role of the RFL to provide that leadership and direction and take as the conduit between the various stakeholders. He was really clear and we agree with that. We agree that that's what should happen. There should be a clear um, direction and vision which are, where the stakeholders are able to buy into and a proper plan to be formulated. You hear the criticism at the moment that there's changes mooted to competition structures when we've got sort of two or three weeks left to run. It's all awfully difficult. Do you, do you believe the RFL want this to be passed through? Do you think the RFL's ideal outcome tomorrow would be that the proposals table get voted? Yes, well, absolutely. Yeah. How, given that, I mean, at the start of course, Ralph was pretty clear that he, the RFL would act in the interest of the whole game, you know, including yourselves. How let down do you feel by the RFL, given that, given what you're saying today? I personally don't feel um, let down, I don't. I don't. Um, um, I think people, executives, directors sort of put themselves into roles and positions and they balance it up and they're making decisions which they clearly think is in, you know, the, the, the interests of the, the themselves or the groups they represent. I, 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 I sort of that all sort of logically flows in, in, in my mind whether they're the right decisions. You've got a group of stakeholders who clearly don't think it's in the game's best interests. I feel let down. I certainly feel let down by the uh, you know, governing body in place to govern the sport and, and, uh, 
and look at every avenue of that sport and that business and I feel as though they haven't done that. Uh, I feel like uh, we're just, we're not, we've, no, we've no leadership, uh, we've no vision, we've, nobody knows which way the sport's going. It's, it's, quite, it's quite sad and alarming that we have got a, a governing body so inept that they have to go get down to dirty tactics with bringing people up on a weekend. I think it's absolutely disgraceful. If Super League don't build up to Colin Andrews for eight, do you think we'll see Slick City? Well, Slick City's an option, isn't it? If they feel strong enough and they think that they've got the ability to do it, then that has to be, it has to be one of the options on the table for them and they've mooted it. If that happens, um, and it goes through and they split and they, they sell the wrong thing. What does that mean for clubs in the Championship and League One? In terms of promotion relegation, that wouldn't that would be possible, would it? They would be a separate entity and you would you would effectively be you'd be in your own competition. What does I, th I think though one of the permutations that we see happening here is the inevitability of inching towards licensing at that point the drawbridge is up. <coughs> These are all poor scenarios. And to even contemplate them, for the for Super League even, they need to be part of, of, of the Rugby League family, Not it's not a divorce. We need to stick together as a family. A lot of people um, in Super League are decent people. We, we're not for one minute saying that they're the enemy. We, we, need, we need to all get together and, and come to a solution that we can all live with. It's a little bit like having a train with three carriages, League One Championship and Super League. And we're sort of racing along and there happen to be 12 seats in, in the first class and 12 in the next and so on and so forth. And what you sort of got is a deviation of the train, you're trying to turn it one particular way and it, on the strength of it there's a real risk of that being uncoupled and racing off by virtue of the fact of the 12 that happen to be sitting in the first carriage. That's sort of a, how yeah, we do You said that there's a need to all work together. If, if the vote doesn't go your way tomorrow, will, will the Championship of League One clubs that voted against this, will they strive to work under the structure that's been put together or will there still be the, the objection to it and the fight to change it further down the track or will you as a group and as a group of clubs look to work under the proposals that, have, that are passed through if that's the case? Well, immediately after the meeting tomorrow the, uh, at, the, at the behest of the RFL there is a meeting of Championship and League One clubs. I think it's un unfair to, to preempt that and say what, what decision would or would not be made. Um, obviously, personally, I just hope that the after tomorrow, or whatever the decision is, that there is some way forward uh, that is a compromise that everybody can live with and we move forward. I'm not confident of that happening. Uh, we said about how we're we disappointed with the, with the RFL. My sentiment is I'm baffled by the RFL, more than disappointed. I'm baffled that with the same DV, uh, TV deal, they're happy to take a £1 million pound cut it's in their logic, monies. In their money. Forget, forget the championship. Suppose we've no value. They're happy to take a £1 million pound cut of their monies. Now, does that mean we've got £1 million pounds worth of fat at the RFL? Or does that mean there's going to be £1 million pound less work done to promote the game, to help grassroots rugby, to develop new players, we've got a massive player shortage. Have we got £1 million even less than we've got now? And they're happy to put that forward as a proposal. That just baffles me. It's How damaging do you think this week, particularly all the stuff that's been in the press, has been for the sport? Very. Very. And could that have been avoided, do you think? Like getting round a table together and chatting. And I don't think we've done anything at any point since the original letter came out than request for that. I remember the RFL Council meeting at which the letter was clearly raised and the request and the agreement of all parties around the table then was to talk more. Why do you think that hasn't happened? I think that's a, you know, that's a question that we've asked ourselves and asked other people um, on numerous times. Sorry, it was culpable then, who's to blame for not getting everyone sat around the table? Is it the RFL, is it Robert Elston? Is it I think, 
uh, probably a culmination of all those those scenarios you've, you've mentioned there. But I think I I am far happier and more content that these guys will will back you up to to do those discussions in public and to have those negotiations in private. Sorry, and to do those negotiations there. Uh, and we have attempted on numerous occasions. I I you know I have met with Robert on behalf of the group, um, and. I would much rather personally have that detail done, done um, on the quiet. However, once certain statements were made public over a period of time, um, then the general rugby league population, you know, the community game, the staff, the players of the game, which again we haven't mentioned, and those clubs need that information in order to make an informed decision. So simply the statements we're putting out is really to just ensure that our members are up to speed with the latest information this advisory group have. They will make their decisions individually. Um, but, you know, unfortunately the tanks were parked on the lawn and we had to do something about that. Uh, hence putting the information in the, uh, in the public arena. I think it's yeah. a lack of um, appreciation of the game below Super League that we're not worth talking to, that's what I, I believe it to be. Yeah. And I mean, a sport cannot just have, have an elite section and nothing underneath. And, and people need to appreciate that, surely. I mean, I, I just look at, from my uh, point of view, as Batley Bulldogs, uh, we're not a Super League team, uh, we probably never will be. Uh, but let's look at the last World Cup. Who were the two best players at the last World Cup for England? And I would say they were Alex Wormsley and Jermaine McGilvery. Alex Wormsley wasn't in the Super League system. He was playing amateur rugby league for Dewsbury Celtic. It was only when John Keir brought him to Batley and gave him a chance at Batley that other clubs uh, noticed his worth and then decided St Helens, uh, who dealt with it brilliantly, um, decided that he needed to go with them, he was at higher, higher standard and look what happened to him. So without showcasing his ability in the championship, would he have been at the World Cup? Jermaine McGilvery was a young man in the Super League system at Huddersfield, right from the start. There came a point when he was young, he wasn't that yet ready for their first team. He came for uh, uh, more than a season long loan to Batley, forget dual registration, more than a season long loan to Batley. That was a higher level than their uh, academy or, or, or uh, lesser teams. That was a higher level that, that helped him, I'm not for one minute saying Batley Bulldogs made him a, a World Cup uh, player, but that helped his development as a player. So if he hadn't have been able to do that, he would have left, been left with not, not playing in, in their first team, would he have developed as, as, as well as he has done? Now, one of the best players in the world. Alex Wormsley, one of the best players in the world. But it, it's a result of the structure underneath. I look at another player, York, Greg Minikin. He was dual reg with us. He was at York, Castleford signed him, a superb player. There are other examples at every, every club here. So there is a value of the sport below Super League, not just in the players that, that, that uh, never aspire beyond the Championship or League One, but in players, in respect of players that can develop into Super League players. So to, just let's value everything below Super League. And let's value the clubs in, in Championship and Super, uh, Championship and League One outside of the playing base, which is just a part. Let's value the role that those clubs play in their communities as centres where people congregate on a regular basis to attend games, to socialise, all the community work that all those clubs endeavour to deliver and work with those amateur clubs that they're working alongside. The risk of losing those clubs would have a dramatic impact in their communities, way outside of producing players for Super League and, and the, the international game, which of course is important. But those clubs have got a real value. And isn't that one of the core values of our sport? That is one of the core values of our sport. So let's embrace it and let's ensure that the growth of Super League, which is what we all want, has a trickle-down process. If the worst comes to the worst, John, and, and you know, this, this uh, £30 million thing came to pass and there was nothing, 
for the Championship and League One clubs. What would happen to your club? It's a very, very, very important decision that everybody needs to be aware of, and mm. the, the, that that kind of thinking process is what Super League clubs, Championship clubs, and League One clubs need to be thinking about when they're going into the vote tomorrow. Mm. Does what level of broadcast? makes my club unviable? I know that's a really important question mm. under that proposal. We can come up with a counter proposal which goes down, the funding goes down and it, and it goes down at a rate where it, it could be possible for you to tailor your club to survive. Mm. So we've, we've come up with a counter proposal. It isn't, it isn't a case of us just saying this is totally unsatisfactory and not coming up with a suggestion. We've come up with a, a reasoned suggestion that if their money goes down, so does ours, and then the game the game can survive. You're going to have to cut your cloth accordingly, but unfortunately there'll be no cloth to cut on this arrangement. Eric, have you been given any sort of assurances that if this does go through tomorrow, you, you would have the, the rights released for you to go out and secure your own TV deal, the Championship and League One? Uh, there has been, yeah, I believe there's been a discussion That's that okay, uh, there see. would potentially be a decoupling within the new broadcast deal. Um, but in dealing in facts and figures, currently that would have a value of zero. Yeah. Matt, a question? Um, you said it, you'd be happy for the votes to be made public. Would you be happy for the EGM itself to be made public, for people to be able to make their own opinion? We'd live stream everything if we could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John Kerr in the changing rooms before they run it, we, we love it. I might have to wear a new shirt, so... <laughs> <laughs> Sponsored by Fox's Biscuits. Kevin, <laughs> going back to your point about tomorrow being such a historic day for the for the sport, not just in the, the next year, but the next few years, uh, do you find it incomprehensible that there's not been careful uh, due diligence uh, with the, the two most important stakeholders in the game, the players and the supporters? I think the player issue is, is a huge one um, and I think you know comments in the press uh, will back that up. This has a direct impact ultimately on players, not only on the number of players that are in the game at part-time and full-time nature, but also obviously you know the finances available and I think that's got a huge knock-on effect. All the way along we have requested fair, honest and independent due diligence and that due diligence would have taken into account all of the major stakeholders in the game of which players would be a key part. So I think you're absolutely right there, mate. yeah. And the, the, the support advice? Yeah, I don't. I think part of the role of the advisory board is to communicate with our members about the information in order that they can then pass it on to their supporters. Um, and clearly, yeah, there are elements that should have been dealt with in private that haven't been, uh, but publicly, supporters will make their decision uh, on the information given. I, I'm not sure that a lot of the club's fans actually know what's what the nuts and bolts of this deal is and I don't think uh, some clubs have, have relayed that information as they should. I mean, don't get me wrong, we've only just got that in two, two days ago, uh, but we've passed that on to all our members and I believe that the fans have a right to know which way their club is voting because this has a massive impact on, on, the, on, on their, their clubs, what they see as theirs and rightly so, uh, and a lot of them, are they going to be here, here next year, year after? I, I don't know if they will be. Do you believe that there's been misinformation communicated from the Super League clubs in the press? I mean, yesterday Ian Lennon made a statement in the Wigan Today paper that, um, you know, Super League's getting regularly 200,000 viewers, but when you actually look at the actual figures, you know, some games uh, from last season, when you talk about the Super X concept, which would be replaced by loop fixtures next year. There was Wigan, uh, sorry, Warrington against Witness, which had 27,000 viewers. Huddersfield in Castleford had 54,000 viewers. Uh, the, the proofs in the pudding, the sport is contracted and unfortunately. I, I, I think the, the soap play has been in a, in a decline for five years and uh, I think the products have been in decline as well. And I honestly believe that by, by the, the championship and league one being as vibrant as it is, that that player pool will, will increase and, and the standards will go up because that will that'll feed into Super League. Just got a couple of other questions. If anyone else has one stick your hand up and then we might just uh, wrap that up with questions and throw it back for any final summary from the panel. Yeah, still that something. 
Do you think there's a realistic possibility that the 2022 rugby league professional season will only have six fixtures? Six fixtures. Please enlighten me. So please. Mm. Oh, six fixtures really per weekend. I thought you meant yeah. the total. <laughs> 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 I was thinking, how have you got that? Yeah. Per weekend. Quite well, though. Yeah. I know we all want less, but six in total. Really well, that's a difficult question to answer. Yeah, you know, with the information we've got, um, I, 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 th I think probably the best answer is by raising it, Phil. You obviously believe it could be um, potentially an issue. By looking at those figures, you will know whether you know that's a more viable or less viable proposition than you put forward. Um, I, I think if that if that deal is accepted um, <coughs> or, or gets through the vote tomorrow. Um, I think your consideration is more likely than not. Is there any final questions? Well, I might throw it back to the table for the summary you want to say, James. We just say you talked about viewing figures there. From a general observation, now all Super League games seem to be on the same night, don't they? So whoever goes to a Super League game live, and you're hoping that that is a high figure in future years to come you hoping it gets higher and higher but they're not watching Super League on the, on the TV are they and I, I, that could affect viewing figures oh, so oh. you know if they spread the fixtures over the weekend then that might help their viewing figures for Super League games um, that's the, the thing that I was thinking about there and then in terms of market research as Martin's pointed out the only market research that has is, is a vote in his newspaper. That's the only only uh, opinion that's been sought of anybody, and, and that hasn't been sought by the, the official channels. It's been sought by a newspaper, uh, which I'm not sure that's ideal. I mean, the, the point about this for is Kevin is quite a pertinent point. Obviously, you know, 27,000 people watching Witness against Warrington in you know the fourth time they've met each other each season, but look yeah. at John and Andrew and York and Bradford uh, this season, you know, the live streaming figures, over 100,000 people have, have watched that game. Matt, just to follow up then to the next steps after this, we will manage due process as the advisory board and uh, we'll go to the meeting tomorrow. There's a meeting immediately after that, the yeah. RFL of us, and um, would you then be making a statement as the advisory board potentially for the press after that, uh, having gone to the membership? And yes, I think we'll once we've consulted them, we yeah. we'll must consult. I think we just need to wrap this up to make it really clear. Um, everybody at this table, and I would imagine everybody within that membership group within Championship and League One, have an absolute passion and drive to support the whole game. This is about a section of the game ensuring that we have a recognisable voice um, and have an ability to trade moving forward and to be engaged in the growth of the whole sport.